Get started, um, I'll introduce myself for anyone in here who doesn't know me tonight. Uh, my name is Austin Scholar. Um, I've been doing your common law assemblies like this uh, for a few months now, probably three or four months now. Um, just by a show of hands real quick, can I see, stick your hand up if this is your first time coming to one of these meetings? God, look at that. Again, that's awesome. Um, consistently, we see like half the room is first timers coming in. Um, more people are hearing about it, coming in and learning about it. Um, so I'm really happy to see new faces in the room. I definitely I like also to see some of the old familiar faces. Thanks guys for showing some of your support, coming in and learning more. But um, it's really encouraging when we see a lot of new faces constantly coming in and, and being part of our, our assembly and learning all the material we have to talk about. So the first thing is, um, <coughs> I'm going to bring our meeting over, um, draw your attention to Carleen. Sorry, Bell. Can we get Carleen on the main screen? I don't know if that's something. Yeah, you guys got it. We'll get Carleen, who is um, transitioning from our convener into becoming more of an uh, our intel officer. Let's call her that. Can you hear me saying that? Okay, all right, good. So Carleen is with us down in Victoria right now. Um, as you guys who have been here before will know that um, you guys will know from before that um, uh, Carleen is um, joining us via Zoom each time. Uh, on occasion she does have other people that join into the meetings as well. Um, but to look like tonight she's by herself. We're, by, we're in the room that we're in. Um, She's going to give us a little bit to get us started, then I'll kick off with some announcements and we'll go to our main speakers for tonight and get a content out there for you guys, okay? So, just... Alright, Carlene, can you hear now? I can now. Alright, you go for it, I'm going to mute. Alright, um, I hope you're talking nice things about me then. <laughs> Alright. Welcome everyone, it's so great to see so many new people uh, arriving in every meeting so obviously like Austin said, the word's getting around that um, the Common Law Assemblies is a place for like-minded people. Um, so welcome aboard the Cairns Common Law Assembly. I do hope that you learn um, a lot from our assembly um, and hello to all of my um, fellow friends there. Um, I miss you, miss you heaps, I miss you heaps. Um, Alright, so a bit of intel. Uh, I've just come back from Canberra. Um, wow, what can I say? Um, it was so exciting to see so many people. Please do not believe what the mass media is trying to tell you, that there was, you know, maybe 10,000. Um, you may have seen um, on social media that the police did count about 1.4 million cars that arrived in a 24-hour period on that Friday and Saturday. So even if you say there's a minimum of two people in the car, in those cars, we had four in ours, we had a, a convoy of over 20 people in from our, uh, our assembly that um, took the seven hour drive to Canberra. Um, we're looking about two and a half million people. Now, uh, hopefully that you've seen some um, footage from uh, different platforms, uh, walking across that bridge and finally when we got up to the top of uh, New Parliament House and when we turned around, we could not see the, see the end. It was just a sea of flags, it was a sea of people, it was a sea of families. Um, I spoke to nurses that have, that have been um, in the job for you know, 25 years, they've lost their jobs. Um, there were servicemen, there was just a array of people there. It was so fantastic to see. Um, I saw um, some people that had made the big trip down from Cairns. It was great to catch up with, up with them. There was people from all four corners of Australia and it was just a beautiful moment. Um, it was history in the making to see all of Australians coming together in one place, not segregated, not all spread out in all the um, other rallies that we've had all around Australia, which is fantastic. But like everyone said, we all came together. 
and uh, it was just a brilliant day. It was just a brilliant day. So um, with those numbers, I'm hoping that uh, our Prime Ministers and the Premiers all around the state were looking out the windows because they were certainly put on notice on the start day. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, we did get to speak to some of the um, other politicians that did um, were brave enough to come out and speak to the people. We've got to give it to them, so that was great. Um, I did get a chance to talk to Ricardo Bossi um, and Malcolm Roberts as well, so I filled them in on a few things that I'm involved in um, down here. Um, they were very excited. Um, so a little bit of information. Um, I, I spoke last um, fortnight about I've been invited to join in on a um, an international civic um, civil, I should say, case that's going to that's it's just growing. It's it's growing in momentum day by day. So it's been um, been a hectic two weeks since I spoke to you last, um, and this is all to do with um, uh, the affidavits and statements that we're taking from the uh, people that have been injured by this um, so-called so-called vaccine or where still the um, families have had a death in their family. Uh, I'm, I'm about to say that the, the um, floodgates are about to open because people are starting to hear that uh, those people have now got a voice. Um, they want to have justice for themselves uh, and for their families. So um, we're being sort of been inundated by by people sort of saying yes, I'm, I'm ready to, to make my, my statement. So we're going about it a little bit of a different way um, than some other organisations. So we're, we're taking this directly to our police stations um, and getting um, a case number and then taking it that way and then getting enough evidence that uh, we'll be serving that into our, our courts, our, our, our courts that we've got at, at the moment. Um, that's about all I can sort of say on that, but um, and I, I hate what we're saying this, but please believe me people, there is so much work being done in the background um, for each and every one of you and your family members and your friends. There is so much work happening. We are doing this by the letter of the law. We are dotting our eyes and crossing our T's to make sure that these families and these, and these people are getting uh, justice. We are going to get justice. Um, and we will be making the people that are, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, um, partaking in this narrative that, that they will be um, put, certainly put on notice and we will be bringing them to our, to our legal system. Uh, what else is happening? Um, it's just been a really hectic time. It really has been hectic. There is so much happening. I hope you're keeping an eye on the convoy over in Canada. Um, we're starting to see how desperate uh, their Prime Minister is over there. Uh, my opinion and, and the intel that I've been um, search, researching on is if Canada falls, then the rest of our governments around the world will start to fall. Really important for Australia to keep an eye on Canada. Uh, if uh, they, they do fall, um, we will be next. Our governments will be falling down. That's in my opinion and in my, in my research, so it's really important to keep giving um, the convoy and um, the Canadians over there. I can tell you they are so tough. If it's minus 30 over there and they're, I can't believe you know how tough they are to be out in that weather, but they're, they're staying strong. They're patriots for their country. They've found the love of their country again, and that's what I want us to find is the love of our country again. Um, and I saw that on the weekend. You know, there was... Uh, look, I'm... Um, um, by, by estimates, it was, would have been at least one and a half million people walking over that bridge at any one time, and just seeing us all coming together uh, really did make your heart sing to say, yes, Australia has found their spirit, and um, we're, we're really bringing it to, to our government. So, our common law, I always say, it's, it's about no loss, injury, or, or harm, um, and we're certainly seeing a lot of that being portrayed on us. So we're here to teach you about your rights and about your common law rights. And we always we always start with our constitution. It is an important document. It's not perfect. Um, we're going to make it, make that perfect um, down the track. And I'm hearing that there is rumblings that a new constitution will be written with the with the people. 
Um, so I would like to hand it over to he goes, I'd like to hand it over to Oscar to enjoy the night and um, I'll give you first some questions and answers at the end of the night. So thank you everyone and uh, I'll pass it over to you, Oscar. Uh, nice little ring talk she's got there. <laughs> Alright, so um, <clears throat> I have uh, some general housekeeping announcements to make for you guys first thing, um, and then we'll get ourselves started with our content for tonight. Um, first one on the list, I have a question that I need to ask, a couple of questions I need to ask from you guys. Has anybody seen Trudeau? <laughs> See here? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good one. Has anybody else seen uh, the Governor General here? <laughs> what the hell? We elect these people to, to do what? Be vacant? In the office? Vacate the office? Anyway, so, so I throw a little bit of humor in the first part of this. Um, we're going to get in. I, I want to talk to you guys a little bit about. Uh, well, I'll get to that in a minute. Let me do announcements first. Stick to it. Stick to it. All right. So, first, first thing is um, we've gone over some of these announcements at the past two meetings, but uh, as you guys know, some of you are coming in for the first time since the holidays. I haven't got a chance to talk to all of you in the past, so I'll just cover over them again real quick, all right? Um, times for our meetings, we're going to try and start on time, finish on time. Be respectful of you guys' time, the facility, the church, so they can get their cleanup done afterwards. Also, my time. I'm a dad. i got to get home. I've got two little kids that are waiting for me to read bedtime story at the end of the night. So, um, uh, as far as um, facilities go, toilets or alcohol out here, um, feel free during the course of the meeting just to get up, go out. There's also coffee, as you've probably already seen, being served out there. Um, Guys, just make it like a casual type of thing. You don't have to wait till the end or anything, or intermission or anything. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, how am I going to contact us um, as far as the assembly goes? So um, we have the. Is Emma here tonight again? No, is she missing. All right, that's all right. Um, Emma's got a website that she has started called. Oh God, I'm blanking on it. I feel like an idiot for this. It's the Autonomy Network, but I forget the name. Is it autonomynetwork.org? .org? Is that what it is? Okay, thanks. Um, so Emma has got um, the autonomynetwork.org. It's a website she's built, and it has a lot of different resources from a lot of different, like, CANS and Form Citizens Network and different action groups and all of that. Ours, she has a little module on there for common law. So we put our information on there, like bulletins, um, when our next meetings will be happening, uh, minutes for the meetings, things that we've covered in the last ones, and also um, any kind of announcements of events that we're going to be putting on, okay? So that's where you can find us, is autonomynetwork.org. Um, and also, I guess, uh, one of the things I'll put out there right now is, if you guys are just coming in after the holiday season, first time back, um, bring paper and, and something to take notes with because we're throwing out a lot of information now that's going to be important for you guys to be able to take it home and digest it. You won't be able to consume all the information here. That's some of the feedback we had from last year is that there was, it was great meetings, so much info, you know, so, so um, we, we did the first basics on Magna Carta and all that, four different meetings just because we knew there was a lot there. But we'd like to have you guys come in here ready to learn. Kind of put yourself back in those old school days of taking some notes down so you can look at it again when you go home and look this stuff up. Um, <clears throat> let's see. We have, uh, as far as contacting us, we also have, those are some flyers out in the lobby out here. Um, there is a, uh, a Proton Mail email account that you can reach us at, and it is admin dot c c l a at protonmail.com so that's the main way that you can contact us directly if you have any inquiries um, <clears throat> if you're trying to get a hold of us about when's the next meeting going to be go to the autonomy network that's all on there um, try not to flood the inbox of the admin lady for with you know, when's the next meeting, or is it going to be at the church, or you know that type of stuff? It'll all be posted on there. Uh, what else have we got? Telegram page. So um, things have kind of simmered down a little bit over the last couple of weeks. Uh, there are two Telegram pages for common law here in Cairns. All right, one of them is us, the other one is not. 
and we need to make it very clear that we're not affiliated with that other page. Um, the people that are running that other page don't have an assembly like this where we come and meet. It's an interest type of group page. They put information out there that's good information, but it's not, if you're looking for meeting info and what we speak about here at our meetings and all that stuff, that's not on their page, okay? So the one that we run, <coughs> sorry, it's called Cairns Common Law Assembly. So you can look us up on Telegram there. Now that's a private page. It's not a public one, it's not open to the public. So to get added to it, there's a couple of things we need you guys to do is, first of all, email us at that admin at ProtonMail, right? That page, that one. Ask us if you can, we can put you on there. It's not a big deal, we can do that. Uh, but we've been finding that people will send us uh, an email and say, hey, let me, can I get added to your, pro your um, Telegram page? And yeah, that's fine. They give, you give us an email or a contact number, but you're not findable, you're not discoverable on Telegram. So what you need to do is you go on Telegram, you look up your profile, right? Look up your little image, and click on the picture or your initials, whatever it may be in the little circle. You get a drop down page that comes up there and it asks you what your profile name is. You have to put something in there. Okay, because you you have a username or sorry profile name, and then you have a username on there. If you don't have both of those in, like, I use an alias for mine. But um, if you don't have that username filled in, you are not findable. That's the beauty of Telegram. Part of it, so this, you can be anonymous on there. Um, you can have your phone number listed on there, but people can't see it. So if you want us to be able to add you, we need to be able to find you, go search for you and find you, and then add you in, or send you the invite like that. Okay, so what you have to do is click on your little picture, or your, your um, initials if you don't have a photo, and then it'll do a drop down, and you'll see on there, like this second or third section down is called your username. Put that in there, type something in, and then send us that, okay? And we'll be able to add you to our Telegram page. Uh, let's see what else we got. Got the flyer out there, good. We are looking, so currently we use the Autonomy Network as our main platform for updates. We are looking at other avenues, um, and we, we are, I'm speaking tonight, we had uh, someone in here, I'm, I won't embarrass you, but we're getting um, extra help with our admin, so that it's not just one person with the burden of all of it going on. Um, let's see. On a personal note, okay, I'm going to throw this out there. Um, I put a note down about it, but <coughs> so guys, um, I hope you can understand that this is not my assembly. I don't run it. I've I've happily got up here on the stage and talked to you guys about a lot of things that we're learning, uh, constitutionally, history of the common law, and where we possibly are going to be going with the common law in this country. But it's not my assembly. It's not my. It's it's ours. Right? By you guys coming in here and being a part of this assembly, you're learning right along with us. There's parts about common law that I still need to learn. Um, I am learning through Bernie. Um, and what I want you to know though is that um, I can't be here for you all the time, 24 seven. Over the course of the last week, I've fielded a minimum of 35 different phone calls or text messages from people saying, I need you to call me right now. I'm like, I'm at work, and I'm dealing with a high-risk situation, and I can't. Or, you know, I was at home getting ready to read the kids a bedtime story, and I'm getting a uh, phone call saying, call me now, or getting in touch with the common law sheriff. And I'm like, uh, I want to help, I do. But you have to understand, this isn't my career, this isn't my job, this is something I'm happy to share with you guys as a community effort. And I want you guys to be able to take your expertise and what you learned from this and be able to share it with others so that it grows bigger. But please understand, I can't be there for everyone to, to bail you out and, and as much as I would love to. Um, and sometimes I just don't even know the knowledge to, to help you. I'd be in a jam too if I was in your situation, right? So where I can, I'm happy to help. But I can, I'm not available 24-7. And so if you're going to try and contact me on my personal number, just know that um, if I'm at work or if I'm busy and I tell you, hey, I can't talk right now, i got to go, and I'll just hang up, don't take that 
with any form of disrespect. It's just a matter of that I'm really am busy and I don't have the time right now to talk to you about that. So I apologize in advance, okay? Okay. <clears throat> Next thing is um, we've got the flags. Um, I, think this one out. I forgot to hang it up tonight, but if you guys aren't aware, you've possibly seen them out at the rallies. That direction for you guys. Have we all seen this before? Yeah. Yeah, I've got uh, like four or five of them left, and I got a new order going in. Yeah. So we use these as, we do these as a fundraiser. You guys have probably seen in all different rallies with people carrying them around. Um, I'm not sure if you've uh, understood or researched the significance of that flag. Um, I'm not going to go into the little history lesson on it right now, but suffice it to say, we can revisit that another time. <coughs> but we do use that as a fundraiser. So we buy them for like almost 20 bucks and we sell them for 30. We make about $11 off of it. It helps us going into publishing things. So putting together like paperwork that we need to have done, making flyers like you see out in the lobby. Um, we're trying to get a couple of those um, gazebo type of uh, shelters that we can take out pop up at different festivals or markets or whatever and share a common model with people. It's things like that. Um, so anyway, fundraisers are there. We've also got one of the t-shirts left from last week. Mick brought it to us. Here it is. You guys might like this, I don't know. <laughs> Same thing. So one of our members has printed these things off. And if you can see on there, it's got the picture of the lion. It says pure blood, unmasked, unvaxxed, and unafraid. And then on the back of it, <laughs> grand old QR code. Alright, you guys can all see that. Anyway, he donated five of these to us from last week and five from the four guy before. So um, they're thirty dollars also. If that's the last one I've got right now. Talk to him about getting some more if we can. I'm not sure. This is a three XL. So hundred percent cotton. I'm sure it'll shrink, but anyway, probably a, a ninety. A 90 shirt. There you go, some pajamas. <laughs> so anyway, um, we've got that one still, still left. And isn't everything these days? It's bad as that. Yeah, yeah, anyway. <clears throat> Next thing I want to mention, um, and I forgot this last week, but, and I apologize to Ray about this already, but I want to apologize in front of everyone. I forgot to mention that last week Ray held a seminar. So um, I don't know if you, anyone has heard about Ray. Ray was one of our first keynote speakers that got up and um, gave a presentation, funny enough, when Len was here last. Yeah. And um, Ray spoke to us about setting up the foundation um, so that it's um, a completely legal way and, and lawful way to basically have your money um, out of the spotlight of the government so they don't see basically all of the money that you're making and then what you're doing with it, it's none of their damn business. Um, so Ray's got a seminar that he puts together. It's um, very informative, fascinating information. I sat through it last fortnight. He did another one today. Um, did you want to throw five minutes in, into that real quick just to describe what you what it is? Come on up real quick then. Um, I'll give it to Ray and um, yeah, I can't, I've got to be honest, I went through it. It's amazing. It's really, really good material. So. Thanks, Austin. Yes, we, uh, we had another one of these today, but I was just thinking it's probably worthwhile recounting the story of how it came about. It's all Janice's fault. Um, I went to the first meeting round at Austin's place out at uh, Redlinch. Yeah. Anyway, there was 35 of us there and we were hearing some fascinating stuff and Janice said, but how do we put this to work in our businesses? And I said, well, this is what I'm doing. And Austin said, can you do a workshop on that? So the next time we got together, I did about 20 minutes or so here. And um, it was rather interesting, the result. That was just before Christmas. I went away to see family down in Brisbane out of Christmas. My phone didn't stop. People kept on saying, can you tell me about this? Can you tell me about that? But, 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 uh. So, one morning, fairly early, I got the computer out and I switched on PowerPoint and I started scribbling. And I put it all together. 
So I got back and uh, I've run two of these workshops now. Uh, they're four hours and they're absolutely jam-packed, as the people who were there would say. It's a real information download, there's no padding in it, it's all usable stuff. Now, what it does is it turns what Austin says and all of the other common law stuff that we're hearing into practical benefits for us. Now what does that mean? One of the guys who was in the first workshop uh, with Austin a couple of weeks ago, he came to me and he said, look, I've got a $200,000 tax bill. I said, you've got a terrible accountant is what you've got. <laughs> anyway, we were able to sit down together and he now doesn't have a tax bill. He has an enormous smile and he has a new accountant. <laughs> and the accountant were on Zoom and the accountant said, now what are you going to tell your wife? He said, I'm going to say, honey, we don't pay any more tax and we make lots more money. And she's going to say, oh, that's good. <laughs> so it's about applying this stuff in ways that matter. Now one of the situations that's going on at the moment, it's a bit of a virus on it actually, is really, really well qualified people such as teachers and nurses who have chosen sovereignty over their bodies and have no jobs. And one lady came along to the workshop and she had been advised that day that she was out of work. Like, that's it, no more. So she came along and she told me afterwards what was going on, so we sat down together following the, the workshop. And at the end of that talk, she made a few decisions. And as she left, she said, I'm frightened, but I'm so excited. A whole new world. So what it is, is putting this stuff that we're hearing about here into a practical application so that you can actually live in your truth, in your sovereignty. And I mean, as this guy said, okay, 200 grand. I'm that far in front now, it doesn't matter anymore. But this is just this year. That's just this year. There's other guys gone through there, they're doing all sorts of crazy things to their businesses and blowing them out in all sorts of ways. So, yeah. This is what's on. So I'm running these on a regular basis around the countryside and if you'd like to know more, I can take some names afterwards. But um, there's some really happy people for Janice. Making a noise that way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Janice. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Raise other name. Oh. Janice. Right, Janice. Jameson, yep, Jameson. Yeah. J-A-M-I-E-S-O-N. Uh, Ray's got a website as well. Um, he always has, he usually brings business cards, but they get taken like, just like that, they go. So, um, catch up to him after the meeting and yeah, he'll have a conversation with you. Um, right, so glad I mentioned that this time and I apologize for last time. All right. uh, one uh, housekeeping announcement for alcohol out here is that um, we've got some of you who have kids that have to bring your kids to the meeting, and I understand that, I get it, I'm a parent. Um, we can't all have babysitters for the kids at home. If your kids are here, can you please have a word with them soon? Like, not right now, but soon right for these announcements maybe. And um, just let them know, that try not to destroy the outlet <laughs> side of the church out in here um, with the cups and uh, you know running around and kind of terrorizing the hallway out there. I know that they get bored. We're in here for two hours, it's difficult for them. But just let them know that, hey, we've got to be respectful of the facility too, okay? Nice. Uh, and then the last one here is that we've got um, the, I guess, kind of a growing interest. Um, it's a really strong interest in a common law assembly for our youth. So are any of you guys under 18 in here? No, not tonight? Yeah, one? Awesome. Thank you for coming. Thanks. Um, no, don't be don't be embarrassed about that. I'm, I'm trying to find you guys because um, over the course of our last few meetings, we've had people come in and they're you know, youngsters, kids, 16, 17. So I think our youngest one was even 14 that came in or 12. Or Errol met someone at a rally. Anyway, they come in and they're we've got some really fireball kids that are passionate about this 
common law stuff. They're learning about the Constitution. They're learning about what their rights are. And about you don't talk to me. You don't push me around. I'm a sovereign and human being. Um, and and they're savvy and they're interested. They really want to talk to their other youth about this. Now, you know how many of us learned the Constitution when we were going through school? Probably hardly any of you. I know. Blame you did here. <laughs> <laughs> But not many, right? And that's by design. So what we want to do is um, <clears throat> we're going to get the kids together, get the youth, get, we're getting the band back together, and um, we'll get these guys a little bit of organization so that they're able to have, like maybe if they need a place to have a meeting, they can come and have their own youth meetings and talk about this kind of stuff. Mentored. Uh, we'd like, we're, I've talked with a couple of people in our assembly here who are interested in maybe mentoring these guys and sharing some knowledge with them, um, getting them on the right track, keeping them on the right track, and then um, go from there as far as we're going to try and see if we can get a couple of initiatives. You guys want to know how, how this common law stuff actually hits the ground and meets the, you know, hits the pavement? We want to talk about getting some of this educa into the education systems again. Talking to some of the school boards and saying, hey, you're an educator. What do you know about the Constitution? <laughs> Why? Right? Why? And, and what are we going to do to change that? Now, I understand that sometimes that's a really high level conversation that goes up past the, the teacher's head and they don't get to decide that. But, you know, who knows? We, if we have enough pressure on the system here, and these teachers know, and these administrators, they know, oftentimes they're held captive by the government right now telling them what they must do with all these mandates, right? So if, if we're able to plant some seeds with them, maybe we can get this stuff back into the schools again, start teaching our kids. Because let's face it, they're the future, we know that. And the more that they're taught this stuff now, we can still recover. You know, I, I came from the US, right? <clears throat> you guys can tell by the accent, but I'm a, um, I'm a military veteran, serving Marine Corps. Um, I love my country, I was a patriot over there. I grew up learning the Constitution. The Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence. When I moved here to Australia 13 years ago, I tried to learn some of that stuff here. Most Aussies would look at me and say, that's a Yank thing, right? That's a Yankee thing. Go back to America. Um, but here we are, you know, a decade later, and now I look around this room. Let me hear it, really. How many of you love your country? Yeah? yeah? yeah. That's why we're here, right? Yeah. You guys are patriots. And I know that's often term, often you know, an American term, but you guys are patriots here in this country, Australian patriots, right? And that's one of the reasons why I like to get up and talk to you guys about this stuff because I took it upon myself to try and learn the Constitution when I came here. I want to know what my rights are, and when I go out and talk to Aussies nowadays, a lot of times people will say, "Oh, we have a Constitution." You know, sometimes people say that to me. Um, they don't really even know what's in it because we weren't taught and. Hidden in all of that that we weren't taught is a lot of your rights. Okay, and we don't want that to disappear. We don't want people to just not know and just carry on life and our and our kids growing up not knowing that they even have these rights. So that's why we're all here tonight, right? Okay, cool. So I'm happy that you guys are all I'm I'm surrounded by a bunch of patriots, like minded people, okay? We come from different walks of life, different countries, but really we all have the same thing in our hearts. Right? We want our country to, to survive this crap that's going on right now and then thrive going through it. Right? We need to learn in order to make that happen though. And, and it's going to be organic. It's going to have to come from us. Not going to come from those guys up there taking in and saying, okay, we'll teach you the Constitution and we'll follow along with it. That's not going to happen. Okay, so that's our announcements. Um, and that's kind of my segue into our first speaker tonight. So, uh, over last fortnight, we started with um, a constitutional session <coughs> and got together with Bernie. He's our Bernie, stick your hand up real quick. Um, got together with Bernie a little while back, and he's uh, he'll, he'll probably be humble enough to say I'm not an expert, but, but he, he walks around with the red annotated version of the Constitution. Um, so, and he knows a lot about it. Um, Look, we broke down the Constitution into different sections and said, look, this is kind of hard material for us to all digest all at once. There's no way anyone in this room would probably sit here and stay awake for a full session of the Constitution and a review of it and going in all the ins and outs of it, right? So 
we have to kind of break it into chunks and say, okay, well, let's keep some attention because we definitely need to learn this stuff, right? We're going to keep your attention by breaking it down into smaller segments. Last fortnight, we talked about the preamble and the general parts of the first uh, eight, eight sections. Is that what we covered? Eight, eight sections of the Constitution. And if you don't know, uh, there are nine sections of our Constitution. The ninth one is pretty much the meat of all of our Constitution, okay? Now, you guys have got some paper in front of you tonight. If you don't have one of those handouts, um, do we have extras? No? All right. Got some over here with Brian. Brian's got some here if you need one. Um, that's kind of your notes to follow along with what Bernie's going to talk about. Scribble some things down on it if you need. It's very handy. Um, and then tonight we're going to go over the Senate. Yep. All right. So um, buckle in. Grab yourself a coffee if you need it. Bernie, come on up. And let's get ourselves started. Give him a little round of applause, guys. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to our convener, Caroline. Before I start, I notice that we've got a few extra new people here tonight. And those who missed out on last week's, uh, the first part of the Constitution, those who are new here, please come up and grab one. Now please keep these because I'll add to it and add to it. Um, and if you miss out tonight, I'll, I'll have them again next week, uh, next, our next meeting, so people will get a part of it. You'll eventually get the whole of the Constitution so you'll know. This is the annotated constitution by Quick and Garren. This is the true constitution 1900 UK. It is been approved by Queen Victoria in, in July 1900. And it follows on right to Queen Elizabeth II today, who is the Queen of Great Britain Northern Ireland, the monarch of the Commonwealth and the keeper of the faith, the heirs and successors and that's the oath that we are swearing at the moment. Well, that's what we should be swearing at the moment, I should say. We've now got Queen Elizabeth II, the Queen of Australia. So, uh, as I said to the people last week, I didn't remember them making Molly Meldrum a queen. <laughs> Anyhow, just so I can get started on this, but first of all, one thing I want to say. This was a great constitution. Now, a lot of people don't believe it was a constant, great constitution. Where the fault? Sorry? It still is. And it still is. You are right, Lynn. This constitution was stolen from us because we, the people, went to sleep. And that's the reason why it never worked. And it started in 1902 with New South Wales and then continued on with the states up to 1975. Alright, now I went through the first part of the Constitution and I'll get on to this now. Our next part is, is part two and it's the Senate. Right, section seven of the Senate shall be composed of senators from each state directly chosen by the people of the state. Voting until the Parliament otherwise provides as one elected. So in other words, they will be, each state is only one electorate. Right? But until the Parliament of the Commonwealth otherwise provides, the Parliament of the States of Queensland, if that state be an original state, 
man made laws, laws dividing the state into division and determining the number of senators to be chosen for each division. And in absence of such provisions, the state shall be one elector. And it is still only one elector. Until the Parliament otherwise provides, there shall be six senators to each original state. The Parliament may make laws increasing or diminishing the number of senators for each state. But so that equal representations of the several original states shall be maintained and that no original state have less than six senators. The senators shall be chosen for a term of six years. Now, when they say six years, when they start, they aren't voted in for six years, but they will have half removed each three years. Right, and that is to coincide with the House of Representatives. So, when they started out, somebody went, they went for six, one lot went for three years, while the remainder went for six years, and then it changed from then on right through. So, it is only, they have six years in, in Parliament. Um, and the names of each senator chosen for each shall, state shall be certified by the Governor to the Governor-General. So we've got a lot of these Governors in these states at the moment uh, thinking they're above the Governor-General and they make rules over the Constitution of the country now. But the Governor-General although he's missing at the moment. Um, and they've put another governor, the Victorian governor, well, I mean, Uncle Dan's, uh, or Chairman Dan's little girl sitting in the governor's house. She's now been made by His Excellency, the Prime Minister Scott Morrison. He appointed her. Huh? Totally different to what our constitution states. But he's above everything. So that's what it is. They must hand the names to the Governor General before they are sworn in to be the Senators of that state. Section number eight. The qualifications of electors of, of Senators shall be in each state that which is prescribed by this constitution, prescribed by this constitution, or by the parliament, as the qualification for electors of members of the House of Representatives. But in the choosing of senators, each electorate shall vote only once. In other words, they can only vote for one person. Not have a preference and vote for eight people. Okay, so so that's the qualifications of the electorate. Now, the Parliament of the Commonwealth may make laws prescribing the method of choosing senators, but so that the method shall be uniform for all the states, subject to any such law, the Parliament of each state may make laws prescribing the method of choosing the Senators for that state. So that's the method of them selecting the Senators. But it must be, remember, it's got to be uniform and it's got to be by the Constitution. When they say uniform, that's what it means. It has to follow the Constitution. The Parliament of the State may make laws for determining the times and places of elections of Senators for the State. Times and places. Well, um, I stand corrected if I'm wrong, but I remember I think that they made a referendum to have the, the three-year terms was to coincide with the House of Representatives elections. 
So it's supposed to happen every three years. So that's been changed. But although this still says, remember, this is a 1900 and this has been, they've been changed since this date. And those changes aren't in here, which I'd like to put them in here, but we need to know the Constitution as it stood at the time. So that is the application of state laws. 11. The Senate may proceed to the, to the dispatch of business, notwithstanding failure of any state to provide for its representation in the Senate. So there's failure to choose a senator. So if the states had a failure of choosing the senator, a senator, the Senate will still continue to this day. Right? They will still sit irregardless of that state not being represented. Right. The governor of any state may cause writs to be issued for the elections of senators for the state. In case of the dissolution of the Senate, the writ shall be issued within 10 days from the pro proclamation of such dissolution. In other words, the governor will off give out the writs to dissolve the parliament or the senate in this case. Right? So the senate will be dissolved and then they will have a new election. But as I said, that they do it, they're in for six years, they go for three years, he'll offer writs for the three years of those people who are to be dissolved from the Senate at that time. So that's the issue of, of the risk. The same thing you'll find when we go through the House of Representatives at the next meeting, um, you'll see that the Governor General will dissolve the Federal Parliament. The same thing, the Governors will do the same thing to the State Parliaments. They will be off, issued a writ to dissolve and then they have to have a re-election. Okay. As soon as, well, number 13, as soon as May be after the Senate's first meets, and after each first meeting of the Senate, following the dissolution thereof, the Senate shall divide the Senators chosen for each into two classes, as nearly equal in number as practicable. So therefore, I was wrong about the uh, referendum that's in the Constitution. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, the places of the Senators of the first class shall become vacant at the expiration of the third year. And the places of those for the second class at the expiration of the sixth year. So that's when they will divide the Senators into two sections and they will then, after that, then they become six years but they, there will be half the Senate will be divided and, and go stand for re-election and that's how it will work. Uh, so that's the rotation of the Senators. The election to fill vacant places shall be made in the year at the expiration of which the places are to become vacant. For the purpose of this section, the term of service of a senator shall be taken to begin on the first day of January, following the day of his election, except in the cases of the first election and of the election next after any dissolution. So in other words, what they will do is they will continue their time from the 1st of January, it will go through until the Senate has been dissolved and their position then becomes tenable, they have to be re-elected or whatever. Okay. Uh, so the Senate, when it shall be taken to begin on the 1st day of January proceedings, the day of his election. And 14, whenever the number of senators for a state is increased or diminished, the Parliament of the Commonwealth may make such provisions for the vacating of the places of the senators for the state 
as it deems necessary to maintain regularity in the rotation. So if somebody goes out of the centre, they can put somebody out back into that position, but it must, they must maintain that time that that senator is supposed to be in there, and that no longer. And that keeps them on the rotation. So if they take the person's place who leaves, they must be, if that, they spent two years in there and, folks, and somebody's been put into that position, only has one year left of it. Okay? So that's further provisions for the rotation. 15. If the place of the senator becomes vacant before the expiration of his term of the service, didn't I just do that, didn't I? <laughs> no, I didn't. Uh, the House of Parliament of the state for which he was chosen shall Sitting and voting together, choose a person to hold the place until the expiration of the term or until the election of a successor or hearing after, provided whichever first happens. So that's the casual vacancies. They go in there and they only fill the position of the person who has left that, as I said before, left that position. And he will take that until the expiration of that original position. Okay. But if the House of the Parliament of the States are not in session at the time when the vacancy is notified, the Governor of the State, with the advice of the Executive, the advice of the Executive Council, thereof may appoint a person to hold the place until the expiration of 14 days after the beginning of the next session of the Parliament of the State or until the election of a successor, whichever first happens. So the Governor can, if they're not sitting in Parliament at the time, the Governor of the State, being given by a name by the Executive Council of the State, can put that name forward and that person will stay in that position until such time as the expiration of all that a, a member is properly elected to the position. Oh, it does, it does too. <laughs> okay. All right. At the next general election of members of the House of Representatives or at the next election of Senators for the State, whichever happens first, a successor shall be in the term, has not then expired, be chosen to hold the place from the date of his election until the expiration of that term. Going again, as I explained, he will fill that term of the original position until the expiration of that time. The name of any senator so chosen or appointed shall be certified by the Governor of the State to the Governor General. He must report the senator to the Governor General so that he knows what senators are of those states. Section 16. The qualifications of a senator shall be the same as those of a member of the House of Representatives. Qualifications, that's the qualifications of a senator. So they must be the same. The Senate shall be, uh, sorry, the Senate shall, before proceeding to the dispatch of any other business, choose a Senator to be the President of the Senate. So it's what they do, the same thing in the House of Representatives. So pick a person out. One is uh, in the Senate, he's the President of the Senate in the House of Representatives, he'll become the Speaker of the House. Um, the President becomes vacant, the Senate shall choose a Senator to be the President. Right, so that's the election of the President in the Senate. The President shall cease to hold his office if he ceases to be a Senator. So, 
once it uh, each term is finished or it goes out of the Senate by reasons unknown. Well, we can figure out a few at the moment, can't we? Um, so he will stay there, and once he becomes removed from the Senate, he can no longer be the president of the Senate. Uh, 18. Before or during any absence of the president, the Senate may choose a senator to perform his duties in his absence. So they can nominate another person to be the president if the president has either been removed or is not uh, in the country or whatever. Absent, that's the absence of the president. Alright, 19. The Senator may, by writing address to the President or to the Governor General, if there is no President or if the President is absent from the Commonwealth, resign his place, which thereupon shall become vacant. That's the resignation of a Senator. That's the procedure he must do to resign the Senate. The place of a senator shall become vacant if the two consecutive months of any session of the parliament he, without the permission of the senate, fails to attend the senate. So if he fails over two months without the permission of the senate to not be in the senate, he can lose his position as a senator. So that's the vacancy to be notified. Right. 22. Until the Parliament otherwise provides the presence of at least one third of the whole number of the Senators shall be... Did I, did I miss one? 21. Oh, I'm sorry. Jeez, I'm trying to rush it. <laughs> Try to give me time here. Uh, 21. Whenever a vacancy happens in the Senate, the President or if there is no president or if the president is absent from the Commonwealth, the Governor-General shall notify the same to the Governor of the state in the representation of which the vacancy has happened. So that is the vacancy to be notified. Alright, number 22, until the Parliament otherwise provides the presence of at least one third of the whole number of Senators shall be necessary to constitute a meeting of the Senate for the exercise of its powers. In other words, it's a quorum. Okay. So that's the way that the, it has to be one third of them. That's why you know, after time to have a look, they're still asleep in the, uh, in the Senate. 23. Questions arising in the Senate shall be determined by the majority of votes, and each Senator shall have one vote. The President shall in all cases be entitled to a vote, and when the votes are equal, the question shall pass to the negative. Voting, that's the voting system in the Senate. So that's your Senate in a nutshell. But, unfortunately we have people that are in the Senate today that are not doing their duties as per the Constitution. They are not in the interest of the people of the country. This, we have two, in our Constitution we have two Houses of Parliament. And just quickly before I close, I'll just say this. The House of Representatives is the House that puts the laws together and the voting together and puts all the agendas that they want to pass. And they pass it in the lower house. But it can never become law until it goes to the Senate. And the Senate is supposedly, supposedly the people's protector. And they are supposed to check that this, what they want to put through from the lower house must be in, 
It was the son of the laws and what the determination of our constitution states. And that's what they must be. They are not to sit in there and read it the way they want to read it themselves. Okay? So this is where the failings are in our, constitu in our constitution and our governments at the moment. Remember, people, they are not governments. It's you, the people, are the government. You, the people, are the Commonwealth of Australia. You're not the, you're not the Australian government. You are the people who put these people in power. They work for you. You don't work for them. And that's what our constitution is all about. So I thank you very much uh, for uh, having that uh, little bit of time. Next one will be the House of Representatives. I took away from that. There's a lot of mentions in there about the Governor General's position, right? Yeah. Well, that's a good question. Where do I have these? Where are these? Um, when I think about government, uh, you know, you have the legislative branches through the uh, House, and you have the Senate, right? Lower House, Upper House, if you want to call them that. And then you have people like a Governor General who holds a lot of power for one person, really. Because as an individual representative, you don't have all that power. You're actually a member of a body of people, right? And they have to vote on things to get them passed as laws. But that governor general, that position is really, really important in this country. And as we learned, that governor general is supposed to be appointed by the crown, not by the prime the, the minister here, if you want to call him the prime minister. And what you guys will also learn is in our constitution here, it doesn't say anything about a prime minister. Did you know that? Anybody ever know that? It says nothing about a prime minister. So, just a quick one, just to let you know, there is no prime minister in this book. He is a person who is a head of the executive council, right? And there's probably, I think that the governor general appoints six people out of. The, the Parliament and that takes in Senators and the House of Representatives to be part of that Executive Council. They call themselves the Executive, well I think it is in the book here, call, call themselves the Executive Government, but irregardless, you got to remember these people are only legislators with limited powers. That's all they've got because that's all we give them. You, me, everybody else, we give them their power. They don't take the power. They haven't got any power. They've just stolen. And that's what they did because we were asleep. But we're all starting to wake up now. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions for Bernie real quick while he's here? Oh, I got it. Yeah, go ahead. Hey, come on back up here, grab your mic. Go ahead over here, yeah. Constitution, they had six years. Right? Now the reason why they put them in for six years is because the, remember I just said to you beforehand, they are the people's representative. The Senate is the place where they're to determine what the Constitution is and any laws that are passed from the lower house which is the government of the day must conform with the Constitution. If they do not conform with the Constitution, it goes back to the lower house. And if they send it back with a few changes of words in it, unless it is with this, they will not. And three years is not enough. And that's what the House of Legislation, uh, the House of Representatives are. They are only there for three years. It's just, now we've got some states have got six years now 
and in some states got four years and it's wrong. The Constitution clearly states three years for the House of Representatives and six years for a Senate. And, they, and I agree the people change it, it's the only way right, that it can be changed. Yeah, that's true what you're asking. I was asking about rotation of them, right? I was. But I'm, I'm also asking, um, why is that work? Sorry, why does it? Why is it important that it's three years and six years? Why? Uh, would it be different if it was ten years or twelve years? Would it? Um, what? What is the value of what uh, we've gone through? Because clearly, um, the Senate is making decisions. I was surprised not to read that there was anything about the. Uh, that the decisions they make be, in some sense, accountable to the public good, in any way accountable to the public good. Right? It's, it's, all we've got there is a constitutional guarantee that they are rotated in a yeah. particular way. Yeah, but the thing but is, to, yeah, yeah, I know what you're saying, right? yeah, but the thing is, you have a look in Victoria now, they've got six years for a House of Representatives. But look, look how that state's gone, because they've had the same person there. By dividing it into six, you're not having the same people all the time. I'm going to put it to Len because Len is an ex-senator. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there is, there is a very simple reason. Well, the reason for dividing it into, into class one and class two, it, it is uh, administered slightly different now. The senators who actually get a full quota uh, of votes become the class two senators and are there for six years. The other senators who rely on preferences become the first class senators. So that's, that's for how the division is, is operated today. The reason why our founders, and they were spot on, right, because you have a continuity in the Senate where the half of the senators remain. There are only six senators now for each state are elected every three years. The exception is if there is a double dissolution then all 12 senators are up for election and then that's where if you get a full quota you become a type 2 senator. I hope that helps. I, I'd just like to add one thing. Len's right in what he's saying, that's what happens today. In this book here it says one person, one vote. No preferences whatsoever. And these, in this book, says they are there for six years. They are divided into class A, class B, because at the start, when they first started, to get to the first three, who are they going to kick out when they've got six senators there? So they had to pick out what they classified as class A and class B. From that point onwards, they became senators for six years but the rotation was every three years and that's how it worked but it's one vote one person you go in there you go in there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's alright come back <laughs> i must have the bottom did i <laughs> um yeah just one vote one person it's not preference voting, that was a Labor thing to bring in so that the two political parties, which was at the time, was the National Party, oh no, they were called the Country Party then, and the Labor Party. And they would be the only two parties that will ever be voted in to Parliament. And that's how they fixed it up. And Stanley Hughes did that in 1914, I think it was, or 15. That's when he changed it to preference vote. So I hope that, that answers your question a little bit for you. Okay. Anyone else have a question? Yeah. Um, I heard during the week that the Governor General was serving yeah. notice to show his legitimacy 
Um, and he hasn't said anything about that. Is the, the, red, the red flag flying the Governor General's? Is, is that correct? I don't, I don't recall seeing the, the, the red flag flying there because he's under the corporation and that's the blue flag. The blue flag is a corporation flag which is a trademark of the UN. It's registered in the US Securities and that's what our blue flag is. It's a UN flag. Right, the red flag is the flag that we fought under in World War I and World War II. Are you saying that people that are there now that raise that flag? The protesters. Yeah. Oh, the protesters. The protesters are going back to our old flag. But we've never ever, to be honest with you, there was never ever a flag approved for Australia at the time. It was put together mainly because of the First World War, so that our troops would fly under a flag and fight there, right? Um, it wasn't until later on that they approved it. And I think it was King George V or could have been King George VI before he passed away. One of, one of the two. Right, so, and that's why the red flag, and that's why they use it. And the blue and white flag with the cross, the white cross, that is the Eureka Stockade flag. That was the fight for freedom in Victoria in the goldfields. And that's what we're all running under now for our freedom, as well as under the blue flag, under the red flag. And that's what we want. The corporate flag is the blue flag. Um, and I'm guessing he hasn't um, proven his legitimate, legitimacy either, has he? Yeah, well, it's, uh, you know, the, what the people are trying to tell, tell the government today, all the governments, I'm talking about state, federal, and the so called illegal, right? Illegal local governments, which don't exist, because in 1974, we had 5-1 no to councils becoming a local government. In 1988, we had 6-0 to say no, we don't want councils to be local governments. In 1999, we voted no again because we said no to a republic. And only 40% of people voted in favour of the Republic. So the rest of the people said no. And they knew that they already had us at a Republic. They had it well and truly before we had the vote. And they had to scramble around and try and find the best ways they can get around them. Now they've lied completely against us and now they've taken control and they've set up <coughs> One thing I, uh, I, I served papers up in Maribra a couple of weeks ago to the police and I said to the senior sergeant who took the documents from me, I said to him, do you know your constitution? And he said, I, could, I couldn't even tell you a word of the constitution. And I said to him, that would probably be about 90 to 95% of the police today throughout this whole country. They don't know the highest law in this country and yet they walk around and they're the law enforcers. And this is where we've got to make people realise that they, are, they themselves don't realise it. They're in treason. They're in a uniform. Now I spent 20 years in the Royal Australian Navy and in that time I learned a lot about this because I've seen things happening in the Royal Australian Navy for a long, long time. And in the end, I was down in the last four years of my career, I was in the supply school down in HMO Service down on Western Port Bay, Victoria. And I've seen a lot of things that was happening and I came across a lot of things that was going to be changed. And I put in a six-page submission to Canberra in the Navy office to tell them that 
the IDF is not workable. And now you throw it in the bin. Because there was a hidden agenda for them to be called the Australian Defence Force. And that was to control the whole of the Defence Force and put in Freemasons at the top level. People were getting promoted who should never have been promoted, but they got promoted because they're in their system. And that's what we've got with our government. They're all in their system. You've got to see the signs. The signs are there. Have a look at the police. They've got blue and white tiles around their hats. What is that? What is it they say? We put it all in plain sight. Blue and white tiles? What do you find in a Masonic light on the floor? Black and white tiles. So they're all Freemasons. All hierarchy are Freemasons. And that's what we're fighting. That's what we're battling against. Clearly, there's, um, there's a lot of different topics, side topics we can try to chase them. Like some people call them rabbit holes. We can, we can go down a lot of those different ones here. Um, I'm going to say, wait, uh, I'm going to keep us on time here. Um, we've probably got about another 40 minutes or so, um, which I'm pretty sure is good enough, right? Um, I'm going to say, wait, us into our next topic, our, our next speaker now. Now, I know that a lot of you will probably have more um, conversation and more questions about um, Constitution and what we're learning. Um, Bernie's available afterwards. Um, I've studied a bit into what you're talking about as well, um, so I'm also usually available afterwards for a little bit. Um, but if you guys do have um, questions about what we've learned tonight, I know some of it can be kind of, um, well, it's not the most stimulating, let's be honest, okay? It, it's, it's true, we've talked about this also. It's not the most stimulating, but it's very, very important for us to understand what that says, okay? If you don't understand it, that's how it got us to this position we're in right now, where the government's just running over the top of us. So, if you do have questions about any of that stuff, if they come up throughout the week, um, network with each other. Talk about it. Bounce it off of other people. Um, talk about you know we have that uh, Telegram page. You can bounce it off of there. You can put it on the um, the autonomy network. Talk about this stuff with others. Okay, that's the only way we're going to keep it learn, keep ourselves learning. The only way we're going to spread it out throughout the community as well. Okay. All right. Thank you, Bernie. Thank you. So the next speaker we're going to bring up here, um, going from a speech about the Senate. We're going to bring up former Senator Len Harris. Come on up, Len. <laughs> now, Len was here to visit us uh, a couple of months back, and when you were here, you spoke to us a little bit about um, properties being taken from us. And um, so he gave us a pretty passionate um, intro to that at first, and then uh, he let us know that coming up on February 18th, there was set to be a hearing in the Supreme Court here in Cairns where you were bringing a case against the government, is that correct? And, um, and, and to defend our property rights and our, the ownership of our titles and the deeds to our properties. So I'm going to let, I'm gonna, not going not to spoil it for you. I'm going to let you talk about the rest of it for right now. Thank you for coming back and speaking with us again. Thank you, Austin. Austin, do you have a mic? Thank you. Do you have a mic? Um, um, yeah. It just makes it much easier. For me. No, 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 now, no, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> every good organisation needs a roadie. <laughs> <laughs> now, just very quickly, um, Austin mentioned Friday. Unfortunately, Friday has been uh, set aside. Uh, Justice Henry uh, was forced into. Um, Isolation. Uh, <laughs> and, oh no, I think I think it is genuine. Good, we're good to go. Uh, 
Now, Justice Henry has been very, very good to us, um, and I wouldn't be at all surprised uh, if he gave the um, Queensland government uh, a certain finger uh, in this. I've just got so much stuff here. So, unfortunately, Friday has been adjourned. I won't find out until tomorrow morning uh, when the, the hearing will actually occur. So my apologies uh, in advance to everyone. I will come down Friday morning uh, at, at 9.30 and be outside the court. I even have people coming from Brisbane who I couldn't turn around. Yeah. Anyhow, it, it happened and uh, I don't believe that uh, Justice Henry had had any say in the matter because he is trying uh, to do some of the smaller cases from his home on video link. Uh, but because I have so much information that I need to hand up on your behalf, it's not suitable uh, to have Justice Henry not in the court. So that's the reason for me declining uh, for Justice Henry to do Friday, actually remotely from his home. So, I've got a, a few brochures here. I know some have been handed out. Uh, if you can just grab them, please. What it is, it's uh, like a time uh, span. If you've already got one, or if you're a couple together, I apologise. Um, yeah. <coughs> it just explains how we have got to where we are now. Now, there's a couple of uh, questions that were relating to the Governor-General uh, while they're going around. I'll explain. On the 25th of January, uh, Rob Colleton and myself served on the Governor General uh, at his uh, residence in Canberra, a document requiring him to provide to the Australian people the documents that underpinned his appointment in, com in, uh, in accordance with the Australian Constitution and Her Majesty's uh, 1986 Letters Patent. He was given three days to actually respond. We did send a, the first reminder uh, to uh, Yarralumba, to the Governor himself, and uh, what actually occurred was that on the 26th the Governor was seen out with the uh, Prime Minister and then, so we, fought, we served the documents on the 25th, 26th was Australia Day, he was out publicly and on the 27th this Government Gazette was issued and it is, it is genuine but there is a gentleman here uh, who has a document that claims the Governor was in, yeah, in South Australia. Correct. Yes. Yeah. So there, is, there are some conflicting uh, information out there regarding to this. So the proclamation says, uh, whereas Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, uh, by commission under Her Royal Sign Manual and Great Seal of Australia, and I'm emphasising that, right? Dated 19 July 2016, appointed me the Honourable Linda de Sewell, uh, uh, Companion of the Order of Australia, Governor of the, the State of Victoria, to administer the Government of the Commonwealth of Australia in the event of the absence of Australia or of the death, incapacity, or removal of the Governor-General for the time being. 
or in the event the Governor General, having temporarily absented himself from office for any reason. And whereas the Governor General, as from today, so the proclamation is dated the 27th uh, of January, and whereas the Governor General is from today absent out of Australia, now let it be known that, having taken the prescribed oath, I have this day assumed the administration of the Government of the Commonwealth of Australia. Now that is signed by herself uh, over the word administrator. And we have on the bottom left hand corner supposedly Scott Morrison's signature Prime Minister. So there are problems with that document, there is absolutely no doubt. So what are we actually doing? Tomorrow uh, there will be a notice uh, in the Australian and in the Fin Review because they are two national uh, newspapers. Uh, I will get clarification before I leave here tonight uh, that that has occurred. If it's not in tomorrow's newspaper, it will definitely be uh, in Thursday's paper. Along with uh, those new two newspapers, the notice has to go into the public notice section of the, uh, the two papers and that is costing uh, Rob and I over $3,000, just the two newspapers. <coughs> However, once they have been distributed Australia-wide, we will take two whole pages out of both of those, uh, of each of those newspapers they will then accompany uh, a letter that I have already penned to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth requesting from her to appoint a Governor General uh, in accord with the Australian Constitution and her letters patent of uh, 1986 and I'll get to speak on that uh, very, very shortly as well. So that's where we are at this time. We're not sure whether we will hand deliver that to Her Majesty or whether it will have to be done through the Home Office because neither Rod nor I are vaccinated and uh, <laughs> would not. and the probability is that we would not be allowed back into Australia. But that is the intent uh, of what we did on January the 25th. So uh, that's uh, the, the situation at the present moment. So very quickly, I'm going to try and do in half an hour what normally takes me uh, an hour and a half. So. Well, I'm going to try. So I'll do this quickly. I'm going to pass this around. This is the basis of the actual court action that I have started on your behalf. I am asking the judge to direct the Queensland Government uh, to actually provide a title deed that has that you seize your property in an estate of fee simple. So that's F-E-E -E and just the word simple. There is no uh, title structure uh, called freehold in the Westminster system. So why are uh, the governments, and they've done this over quite a few years, brought in uh, the system which they refer to as freehold? Well, it's very simple because when your property 
is divested of the crown to you in fee simple, the government is stopped from passing law on fee simple. It is that simple. <laughs> okay? So, what is the first or one of the main issues that I'm asking Justice Henry to direct the Queensland Government to issue a title to every uh, property in Queensland that they have actually uh, revoked. Not only do you not get a certificate of title now under the, the Act, the Land, Comma, Explosives and Other Legislative Amendment Act, not only do, do you not get a title, but on the 1st of October 2019, the Queensland Government revoked all deeds. I wasn't aware of that the last time I was here. So, I've also asked that the reservations to the Crown be put back on the titles. The reservations for the Crown reserve basically mineral, coal, petroleum and the uh, royalties that are paid by the persons extracting them goes to the government to provide services for you and I. So in that they are reserved to the Crown, the purpose of them being reserved to the Crown so that we, the population, derive the benefit from them. The next thing that I ask for is that every title must contain upon its face the actual surveyor's drawings of your property. <laughs> the next thing, just near my thumb, is that the, the actual title itself be sealed with Queen Victoria's Great Queensland seal. Not, not what they're using now. So, another thing that uh, the government did on 1 October 2019 was they actually removed their responsibility to actually record mortgages. Because up until 1 October, every mortgage was actually tied, uh, was tied to the title deed. There they are, on the back of that. They are no longer tied to the title. Now there is some speculation in this, and I normally do not use speculation, but I speculate the reason that was done is so that it would give the banks or mortgagers some actual legal standing for on selling your mortgages. So I'll pass this around, have a look at it. So they're the things you're looking for. You're looking to see that it is issued in fee simple, that it has the, the surveyor's diagram on it, it has the seal of, of uh, the Great Seal of Queensland and that's the security because in actuality the Governor is supposed to, he is commanded to have total security over that seal and he's also instructed in Queen Victoria's uh, proclamation, right? That the, the governor is to seal everything that passes his desk with that great seal. Now, what's the difference between a proclamation and a letters patent? A letters patent is a contract between the crown and the person who is being appointed to a position. So, subsequent uh, sovereigns can 
are in and through the Lord's spiritual and the Lord's temporal. So it's not the Queen herself doing anything totally by herself. She must have the imprimatur of the 50 bishops who actually uh, are ordained in the 50 cathedrals in England. So they sit in the House of Lords and their purpose is to uh, make sure that all of the laws are in accordance with God's law. That's why they're there. So they're the Lord's spiritual. That one's easy to, to make the connection. The barons, they are the Lord's temporal. Well, I don't know whether they're swearing there that they don't drink ale, but, <laughs> but they are the, the, the land barons. So in England, they have 50 uh, barons as Lord temporal, in the House of Common, uh, in the House, the sorry, in the House of Lords, and they are there to look after the property owners in England, and that's what we are missing here in Australia. So, where do we actually get started? I want to actually start in 1987. So, if you have a look at that little brochure that's been passed around. You'll see on the top of it uh, Micah Hearn's photograph. So what Micah Hearn did in 1987 was to actually change the role of the governor. And that is a very important question that I intend to put to Justice Henry. Where did Micah Hearn get the power to alter the role of the governor? He can't. It's impossible. There's a maximum at law which states very clearly a river cannot rise higher than its source. So if you think of the Barren River coming through here uh, in, in Cairns, which has its headquarters up in the, uh, the hip of the mountains, uh, up behind Cairns, how can that river actually flow past the height of, of its source. So that's what the maxim is saying. Micah Hearn is appointed by the Crown. He's appointed by, or he's actually sworn in by the Governor of Queensland. So how can he as Premier alter the Governor's role? Well the short answer to that is it can't. He also claims to have actually established the Executive Council that the Labor Party uh, abolished in 1922. So he made the Governor General uh, Governor in Council. And then in the back of this Act, right at the back, I've marked a couple of sections there where the wording uh, in, well, it actually does legally remove the Governor's ability to reserve a bill for Her Majesty's pleasure. And that is exactly what has allowed every Queensland Government since 1987 the ability that once they pass a law in, in the Legislative Assembly, the lower house, it is law. The, gov the Governor in Queensland, um, they certainly haven't learnt their, their um, constitution, uh, Austin, <laughs> because if they did and knew their job, they would refuse to actually rubber stamp every bill. So that's um, now I'm going to pass two of these out together. The reason is I want you to have a look at the actual seals on the two documents. The white one was actually uh, produced in 1987. The blue one uh, is reprint 1B uh, in 1997. 
Have a look at the seal. The one on the white one yeah, <laughs> is uh, uh, the lion and the unicorn, which is Her Majesty's seal. Right? The one on the lower is uh, a deer and a brolga. So the significance of that, the best way for me to uh, explain that to you is years and years ago I, I grew up in a little town called Tugulua and we had the tough old Sergeant, Sergeant Neil who would get around in a pair of blue boots, a pair of shorts and a Jackie Howe singlet. And when you saw the Sarge in town and, that, and that's how he was dressed, everything was fine. But the moment he put his hand inside his car and picked up his hat and put it on his head, you got the hell out of there. Why? Because Her Majesty's seal was the badge that was on his hat. He, the moment he put that hat on, was operating under the crown. And that's what we need to go back and get back to. Okay, so have a look at those. The next, uh, the, uh, I will do questions at the end. The next thing is in 1992, and originally uh, I thought this was Peter Beattie, so I'll publicly apologise to Peter Beattie because he, his ugly face used to be on that sheet, uh, but in actuality it was Wayne Goss. The purpose of the act is just to make uh, minor changes uh, to an act so the bureaucrats would then alter that, you know, if it was diction or spelling or uh, commas or full stops. But it does actually say in section 7 very clearly and very succinctly that an alteration cannot alter the purpose of the division. So it's made purely just for minor uh, changes. So I'll pass that one around over this side. So that's the, that's the two on the front of your little brochure. Now we turn over to the back. And this is quite astounding. What actually occurred was the uh, New South Wales, the government in New South Wales passed through the New South Wales Parliament an act for the purpose of electronic lodgement New South Wales 2012. Now they have the power to do that, there's no dispute about that. However, it's what they then did with that act. They took that act to COAG. Now, COAG is the actual uh, uh, coalition of Australian government, C-O-A-G. Coalition of Australian governments. COAG, in its, when it was uh, an entity had no legislative support and it also has no conscious con constitutional standing. I'm getting hands lines. Right, okay. How do you do this? You can't. Okay, what um, New South Wales did. They took that act to COAG. It was accepted by all of the, uh, the states and territories. So now in Queensland we have electronic conveyancing national law Queensland that has never been debated in the Parliament and the Queensland Government cannot change that act. So if someone will run that over, run it up that other side. Okay, I'm going to forget about 
the monster that cancels all your um, titles. Uh, I apologise to anyone who's here tonight, but it's just impossible to get through all of this. So, what is the most outrageous thing that the Queensland Government has now done? In 2021, the Queensland Government passed an act called Australian, uh, Queensland's Future Fund Title Registry Act 2021. In that act, it purports to actually establish a proprietary limited company. And if I can find the right page. <laughs> Declaration of the Operator. So we have an Act of Parliament that is declaring that Queensland Title Registry Proprietary Limited is the operator of the Act. So we no longer have a titles office, we have a private company functioning as the titles office. When you go over the page, it tells you that the titles uh, Queensland, uh, Queensland Futures Fund uh, in establishing a private company then says that the company can set the, the fee for registering a title. Currently it's $197. The Act also says that that proprietary limited company gets to collect and keep the funds. So we have a private company that anybody who's purchased a, a property from um, uh, 1 October 2019, that money has gone to that private company the Queensland Government has also tipped $5 billion into that private company and they also have moved 7.4 uh, Orion uh, shares, that's the shares for the Queensland Government's rail. So why have they done that? They've done that purely as a sinking fund that they can go overseas and borrow in the name of the proprietary limited company. Because the likes of Standard and Paws had advised the Queensland Government that they were going to reduce their triple A rating. So that's part of the reason. Um, I just want to leave, read one very, very small section uh, and this is a document uh, by Westpac Bank and it's in relation to the, the Westpac Bank being made and I will read it. Um, the mortgages are then transferred into trucks uh, with what are termed SPVs, so Special Service Vehicles and then notes of commercial paper are offered to investments uh, in the, the secondary market backed by the securities. Uh, you will not receive notice uh, or of any assignment of your mortgage uh, as that could create a title uh, perfection event and collapse the trusts. So that would if you start questioning where your mortgages are at the moment, it puts the whole system uh, at jeopardy. To prevent this, the trusts have hired Westpac as the services of the loans under a pooling and servicing agreement so that we may continue to collect mortgage payments and interest from you to pass on to them 
that's the, the entities that have purchased the, the certificates. And it's the last paragraph which is absolutely outrageous. We have ensured that at a branch level our staff will not be aware of any assignment of your mortgage and as such will not be able to assist in the matter. That is an official document <coughs> from Westpac. So I apologise again all of you who were uh, setting out to come on Friday. I will endeavour as soon as I can tomorrow morning to get uh, notices out on Telegram, Facebook, web page and another gentleman asked me the governor has run away. <laughs> well we've got to laugh as, as Austin was saying earlier or we would cry. Yes, so uh, thank you very much. I'll let you know as soon as I can. Oh, yes. Yes. Just one other thing. I have brought down uh, um, affidavits and a friend of mine, uh, uh, Gay, has actually offered, she's brought all her JP uh, documents with her to actually JP them. And can I just say in closing, what Rod uh, Collison and I did serving the Governor is the purest form of common law. Uh, the documents from that uh, will be actually witnessed by a uh, public notary. So why would we do that? Well, I'll tell you exactly why. Because public notaries in Queensland are appointed by the Archbishop of Canterbury and has nothing to do with the legislative or the courts. So when we have uh, finished with the, the letter that I have read to Her Majesty, the two paper, pages of the paper will go with a request to Her Majesty uh, to actually, I can't obviously make the contents of the letter uh, public at the moment. Uh, it will be for Her Majesty's own eyes initially until she decides what she wants to do. Thank you. Was can anyone take um, photos of the deed? Yes, you can. I would ask you, uh, with the greatest of respect, uh, that is Mrs. DiMaggio's actual deed. It's not a cop. So, uh, sorry, treat it with the reverence of what it is, and next year that document will be a hundred years old. Guys, as you can tell, Len's very passionate about this subject, right? <coughs> and I think he's asked for our help to support it. Now I'm going to ask you a couple questions real quick before we leave the stage. I know we're closing in our closing time here. Um, how can we, now tomorrow you're going to find out some more information about the court hearing, right? And then you're going to try and publish that to us, um, get that information to us as, a, as an assembly, and I'll make sure it gets published on our, um, our Telegram page, yep. it'll get published on Emma's website, um, and then any other way that we can get the word out for you, we'll do that as well. Um, but we, we've been speaking a little bit about this over the course of the last couple few weeks, talking about how um, Len's fighting this fight for all of us. And he's asked us for help. And one of the ways that we can do that is our physical presence there at the courtroom, courthouse, when the day goes down, right? Absolutely. Yep, okay. If there's anything else that you need our help with um, from the masses and from the people, because we do have a little bit of a reach now in the community, 
Um, we've got numbers of people who are showing up, 150, 200 people per session, and half the room oftentimes is new people. And we go out and we talk. So let us know how we can help you. We'll fight that cause with you if we can. Yeah, okay, go ahead. So the, one of the major things that you can do uh, to help ourselves, because who, who is the silent majority? Put your hand up. Yeah, all of us, right? So when you go home, if you can, go onto the website. The website's on the, the little brochures that I've handed out. Uh, uh, sign in for the updates so that we can keep in touch with you. And then the other thing is, when you've done that, then send the website out to everyone in your contacts. It doesn't matter whether they're Queensland or not. This issue now is a national issue. So if you could do that, that would be absolutely fabulous. If you want to toss 20 bucks in, uh, to help us get through the court costs, that would be great, greatly appreciated. I'll just ask Gay to stand up, please. <laughs> she hates this. <laughs> She'll beat me up afterwards. Gay is here with her little port of goods and she will actually stamp any uh, affidavits that you want to fill out tonight. Just make them real simple. Uh, tell the, the Queensland Government why you're upset, right? Why have you cancelled my title deeds? Uh, and ask the court to actually strike the legislation down. Thank you. Right, thank you. We've got to stay in this fight together, right? It's the power of the, um, power of the people. It's strength in numbers, yeah? And that's what Len's asking us to help him with, is strengthening the numbers. Now, um, that's going to bring us to an end for our meeting tonight. All right? um, I plan on having a little bit of a Q&A session, and, and clearly you guys can see that Len's got a lot of material that he would like to go through with us. As he said, it take, usually takes him about an hour and a half to get through that, but we don't have that kind of time in our meetings here unless we schedule you in again. Just a one-off night. We can do that. We can do that. If you're happy to do it, or we'll invite you back. Yeah? Awesome. I have to, I've been asked to go back to camp.